Hello, my name is Christina Tolbo and I study at the last year of my master here at the Niels Bohr Institute at Copenhagen University. My name is Jonathan and I'm studying biotechnology and I've just begun on my master's. But we only represent some of our team. We are nine people all in all and from very different uh, science areas. So all from molecular biomedicine to astrophysics and business. And our team, we have had this project the last year or so called Space Moss. And Space Moss is about space travel, as it says in the name, but it is about how we get to Mars. Because Mars is very far away. And when you get there, it's not a very kind planet to be on. It will try, try to freeze you, it will try to kill you with radiation, it won't shield you in any way, and its soil is toxic. So it's a harsh place to be. And that means that, first of all, it's expensive and dangerous to get there, but when you get there, it's even more expensive and more dangerous. So NASA has calculated that if you want to put people on Mars, then it costs up to $16,000 per kilogram that you want to send. And this is everything. So you have to have fuel, you have to have food, you have to have something that you can put your trash in, clothes and everything to entertain yourself for more than a year. So as Team Space Moss, our mission was easy. We wanted to see how we could pack the lightest luggage. And we thought, okay, we need to not bring a lot. And when we have not a lot, we wanted to multiply and become more. And what does that? Plants. So we thought, why not um, grow and design a plant in a, a greenhouse in such a way that we can, we can make the things that we need on site. So when we're on Mars, we could grow the things that we need. And here I'm not talking about food, as you would usually think, but more the other components that are necessary to survive on Mars. For example, medicine or vitamins, flavors or plastic. If you could do that on Mars, then you could expand your base from, from within and you could have a, yeah, a greenhouse with a section for each of the things that you need. So we needed to find a plant and for that we thought, why not moss? So the thing we want to use moss for is first of all, make it able to produce the components that astronauts might be, and that may be either pharmaceuticals or something else entirely. We also want to see if we can make the moss better adapted to the Martian environment. That would mean that the astronauts could uh, grow moss without using as much energy as they would otherwise. But why on earth would you use moss? Well, so Mars has already been used quite extensively within plant biology. So you know a lot about it, you know how it works, well, some of how it works at least, and it's, you know how its genome looks and so on. Uh, it's also been used to produce certain kinds of pharmaceuticals before, so we know it can be used to do that. Besides, it's a plant, and that's besides having good feng shui on a spaceship, it's also pretty nice to have something that produces oxygen and as plant goes, this is a pretty tough one. It's able to grow under many different conditions and doesn't require a whole lot of nutrients, so that makes it easy also. But the first thing we wanted to do was to make it more adapted to the Martian environment. And we start by focusing on the very cold temperatures on Mars. So it gets well below freezing at night on Mars, and so we thought, okay, could we do something that makes Mars better able to survive? And so we found this little fella. This is the spruce botworm, and it's actually an American pine tree pest. It lives off pine trees, and it's actually become quite a big problem in the US because the winters there has not been cold enough in the recent years to kill them off. Now, what makes this little larvae so tough is that it makes a protein and this protein is able to inhibit the ice crystals from forming inside the larvae. That means the ice crystals cannot grow big enough to rupture its cells and thus protects it from cold. Oh, so we took DNA from this, the spruce spotworm, rather the DNA that makes the antifreeze protein, and we inserted it into moss. But we also had DNA from a jellyfish and this DNA from the jellyfish makes a protein that lights up 
when you shine light with a specific wavelength on it. That means that we're going to be able to see if all our DNA has been inserted correctly, because then the cells would light up. Okay, so we inserted our DNA into Mars, and a couple of weeks after, we returned. And we had very small clumps of Mars. These are like this tiny. Uh, and here you see one of the transformed clump of Mars, one of the genetically modified. And here you see the bright autofluorescence, that light that living plant cells emits. And on the last picture, you see the marker protein. Well, that was quite exciting. So that at least indicated that our DNA had been inserted correctly. But now the question was, does this antifreeze protein actually make a difference? Does it make Mars better able to survive? And for that, we built this high-tech, NASA-worthy machine. Right. So this machine consists of a big polystyrene box, which you can fill with dry ice. And then we jammed an aluminium rod into it, part of which is sticking out here. And so the thing is that the aluminium rod gets pretty cold, close to the box, and it gets more like room temperature out in the, uh, when you get further out. And then we were able to tape moss, plates containing moss, uh, along different uh, places on the aluminium rod. And we were able to measure the temperature at these different points with thermosensors. So what we did was that we took some normal moss and we took some of our genetically modified antifreeze moss and we froze it down to minus 20 degrees. And then we saw how well was the moss able to survive. And what you see in this picture is the normal moss that's at the bottom. That's what we call wild type moss. And it looks pretty dead. Looks pretty dead, looks pretty brown and gooey and you would expect if we were alive to see some very bright light shining here, but you don't. So this seems to be pretty dead. And for most part, the antifreeze moss looked the same, but there was one clump, that's the one you see on top, that still looked kind of alive. And that was because it still had some very bright light from some of its cells. The light I mentioned before that all living plant cells emits autofluorescence. And that suggests that these cells are still, in fact, alive and thus that our antifreeze protein might have worked. But we are in the process of growing more antifreeze moss, so we'll do some more experiments later. In general, we hope to do much more next year. So we hope to set a new team, because this is part of a competition. Project Space Moss was part of a, of a competition called iGEM. And iGEM is a well-known and very pre prestigious uh, competition from MIT, one of the world's most uh, known and also best universities. So here we are at the competition in Boston last uh, month where we got to present our project with 260 teams from around the world and it was very inspirational. But what I want to tell you now is that it's not mm, competition that's the most important thing. It is the path to the competition. So we spent almost a year on this project. And what we learned is to, to manage a small research group of nine people with supervisors and professors and high school students who wanted to help. And we learned how to communicate our field to people who are not usually in that field and uh, to communicate it to people who are not in science at all. Among other things we did, we made a cartoon so that everyone could understand it without having to listen to us. Um, and we also, had to make a web page, a social media platform, and we had to create our own, or not create, but get our own money, our own funding, and, and convince people that this is a good project. So we went all over the world to northern Sweden, to southern Sweden, we're going to Germany, and now we're here. And we've also been to in, in the radio, both in, in Denmark and in other countries. And maybe some of you have seen us in the newspapers in Denmark, because we have been in quite a few here are some of the newspapers that we've been in. We were actually the most printed article from Ritzau, the news agency in Denmark, uh, the week before we went to Boston to compete. And as you see here, New Scientist is really big and in the middle of, of the screen. And that's because we are very proud to be in New Scientist, which is one of the biggest uh, 
science magazines for the general public in the world. And that means that we got across that students can do science that are important and relevant for people to listen to, and also that there should be a fundament, uh, or like a, there should be a ground base for, for students to do projects on, so that we can all experience the experience that we had. So I would like to end with saying thank you to the rest of our team because they've been much as, as much a part of it as we have and our sponsors who we did convince they needed to give us money. <laughs> so that's good. Thank you.